He'd been drinking in Brendan Brown's club the night he died. So on that night, what were your last memories of Thomas Quinn? Just of Tommy leaving the club to go up home and shouting good night, tell him just the usual. I actually shouted good night, touch, see him or, and that was it. Your brother at that stage was working for O'Kane's yes. undertakers around the corner and, and picked Thomas Quinn's they had body the, up. They had the contract with the coroner for to pick anybody up here today suddenly. And whenever he came back, we asked him, was it anybody we knew? She says, no, I've never seen the man before in my life. How did he not recognise him? Well, the man was mangled. The 55-year-old road sweeper was found at this spot. Much the worse for drink one evening, he was grabbed by the gang, bundled into a car and driven here to his death. I remember the body laying again, this pitiful looking man, his throat cut. Cut in the same way? Yes. In the Thomas Quinn murder, along the route, there had been a, a noise heard of a, a heavy sounding engine like a black taxi. So then they got looking at who had black taxis and that sort of thing, you know, a wide, wide scale inquiry. But there were, I think, seven or eight hundred black taxis operating in the area at that time. During the investigation, the police say William Moore's taxi was forensically tested at least once. But they found nothing. Do you think at that stage you're looking for one man? No because obviously both men had been overpowered and taken to their place of execution and one man couldn't have done that. And you're trying to find out in your own head, OK, who within my patch hates Catholics that much? A lot of people, unfortunately, at that stage. An awful lot of names who could kill someone in that such a brutal way. Well, there were hundreds of paramilitaries who, who resided in the area. Was Murphy or anyone like him remotely on the radar? He would have been on the radar, yeah. Why? Simply because, you know, he was sort of a cunning boy. We, we knew he was in the UVF, but he very, very much kept a low profile. There'd be no stress down here, Jim? No, very quiet life most of the time. Investigative journalist Jim Campbell says he spoke to loyalist leaders on the Schenkel, who said they knew precisely who was running the gang. Well, I had started writing about the, the Butcher Gang back in the, I imagine it was the early 70s, even before a lot of people realised that there were serial killers on the loose. I was picking up reports about this man who they called a, a bloody psychopath. They, like many members of the local community, were frightened of him. Not perhaps of what he would do himself, but what he was capable of ordering others to do. This and was Murphy? Murphy, Lenny Murphy. We couldn't publish Murphy's name at the time because we had no proof, just as the police at that time had no proof. But it was the name within journalistic circles, within loyalism. And within the police. And within the police. Oh yeah, the police would have known that Lenny Murphy was the leader of the gang. That's not what they're telling me, Jim. Well, it's amazing because most people on the Shankill Road knew Lenny Murphy, knew what he was up to, and lived in total fear of him. Lenny Murphy was not amenable to the hierarchy in the UVF. He did, he kept involved in, in certain activities with their approval and, and what they authorised him to do. But when they moved into this cutthroat killings, they became almost a renegade breakaway group. And I'm satisfied that the UVF hierarchy did not know who was carrying out these murders. Did not know. Did not know. And certainly would not have given her approval. That's a big statement to make. Yeah. For a man that bases everything on evidence. Yeah. Probably it's inconceivable too. with respect, Jimmy. It's inconceivable that in such a tight-knit community where everybody knows where everybody's moving, the police didn't know, 
And now the UVF doesn't know either. Yeah. Inconceivable. A very tightly knit circle. No one in the, in the circle talked. They were too frightened to talk. I would imagine there would have been at least 30-40% of the community would have known who the butchers were, but they weren't going to name them. These people got such a grip in the community, and there was such fear, you didn't cross them. I very often ask, ask myself, did the leaders of the UDA and the UVF know what was going on? Was this being done in their name? Were they allowing this to happen? Because at that time I was of the impression nothing would happen in the area that they didn't sanction, in the same way you'd say about the provisional IRA. You just have your own thoughts about it. Just over a fortnight after Thomas Quinn was murdered, a fourth butchered victim. Francis Rice was picked up in Millfield. His throat was cut. His body was dumped in an entry off the Shankill Road. Did you have any people that you were watching more closely? No, we were no further forward. So the butchers were winning? They were winning. They, they were getting the headlines and the, the fear that they instilled, it affected the whole city. It has got to be stopped, one way or another. If this goes on and if the government allows this to go on, basic humanity is going to break down. Our whole civilization is at stake here. Mr Passmore, you've used fairly extreme language in describing these killers. You've described them as Jack the Ripper types. Well, Jack the Ripper is a gruesome character, I suppose, in history. And to me, this is gruesome. This is inhuman. Bestial. It's... The fact that the people were getting picked up randomly and usually, as far as I know, they were all innocent people. There was, so it wasn't as if, well, I'm not involved in that, so I'm safe. It, you didn't have to be anybody. You could be anybody going about your business. You know, that, that was what was so fearsome about it. The killers were dubbed the Shankill Butchers. It shamed the Shankill community. It shamed it. What's wrong with that label? Well, I mean, in my opinion, they shouldn't have been called the Shankill Butchers. They were murdering thugs. Shackle was put on them deliberately to raise the profile that this is happening in the Protestant community. But that's the media's fault. It was now three months since their first victim and with no sign of the Shankle butchers being caught, reports of their sadism spread like wildfire. And there have been some very well-known teams of serial killers that have operated uh, in the UK in particular, for example, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, Fred and Rosemary West. Um, what are your thoughts on the type of people that they were, the type of person Lenny Murphy was? It seems that there is a very specific hatred he had for Catholics, and he was going to do anything he could to, to, to bring to stop Catholics encroaching on his territory, community, whatever. So it is an aberrant behaviour. The, the difficulty is trying to explain it, that psychopathy or the psychopath is one explanation for it. There may well be others as well. Like what? Well, it may be that they, they, they could almost form themselves into an army, and so they think they're defending territory, uh, just as not legitimate army as, say, British army or other armies around the world, but they have that type of mentality, that they're defending a particular area. There was so much press about the Shankill Butchers. Do you think that empowered this gang? drove them to kill even more? The power aspect that individuals would have got from this uh, would have been uh, very high, given the, 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 the reporting levels that appeared to be at the time, and also the amount of terror which appears to have been placed into the community by their action, again, would have given them the feelings of power. With no sign of police catching the gang, on both sides of the community, fear intensified. People in North Belfast now dreaded having to go out. We never went anywhere. After it got dark, you never ever went anywhere on your own. It really was, it really was the most fearful time I've ever had in my life. When people did venture out, their greatest fear was of being approached by a black taxi. There was one night we came out, my brother got into the car and I went to lock a club up. And my brother shouted to me, quick, Brent, get into the effing car. And I jumped into the car. And as we were driving down the street, down at the far end down here, 
They had a young lad against the wall, the black taxi was sitting, you could just see the half of the taxi, the front half of it was up past the houses in Stephen Street. And my brothers told us later, one of them was shooting, take him up a shankle and get the knife, and the other one was shooting, shoot the Fenian bastard. Whenever he heard the door banging and the car lights turning, he says he realised then that he wasn't his own, and that's when he made his brick to run. Ask anybody from this district, and they'll tell you they could have picked the butchers up at any stage. How come? They, they knew who they were. And they could have picked them up at any stage. People around here is of the opinion the butchers were allowed a free home. And no, nobody will convince them of any different. Although the taxis were, were, were heard, there were no, no number plates uh, noticed. You know, the registration numbers weren't taken, it was just a black taxi. But you mean they're a taxi full of knives and hatchets? Oh. If I listen to some people from the Catholic community, you weren't trying to find these butchers. You and your men were turning a blind eye to these killers. No, that's, that's absolute nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> these people were killers. They were killing innocent, purely innocent victims, people who were involved in nothing, brutality, savagery, horrific killings, and we wanted to catch them. And we put every effort that we could into catching them. But it didn't stop Catholics being killed. My understanding of it was that had these victims been Protestants, this would never have been allowed to go on for as long as it did. Basically it said, you are like dogs on the street. You know, these are second class citizens, you just don't matter anyway, this is our country. And if we want to take somebody out and we want to cut them to pieces, well sure that's fine. We'll do that. We have done it. Look at us, we're getting away with it. Some people speculated that it might have suited the security forces to build up this tension within the, the two communities because it certainly did build up terrible tension. Are you telling me that innocent Catholics were literally having their, their throats slit and the British establishment knew who was doing it? Yes, I firmly believe that. The RUC Special Branch, MI5 and military intelligence had infiltrated the IRA to the highest level. Do you mean to tell me that they weren't able to infiltrate the Shankill Butchers? We tried everything possible to solve all murders, no matter by whom they were carried out. We didn't go after loyalist paramilitaries or Republican paramilitaries even after killers. Jimmy Nesbitt insists no informants were able to penetrate the gang. He's equally adamant Murphy himself was not in any way controlled by police, army or intelligence forces. That's utterly impossible. Well, impossible? You, you might not have known. I would have known. Murphy certainly was in no way being controlled by anyone. You would not have known. By the very nature of how they work, they wouldn't have told you. No, they wouldn't have told me. So how can but, you tell me it didn't happen? But I know from all the investigations over a period of months, all the rest of it, you can read people, you get to know people, and that. And Murphy was not an informant type. He was out to commit murder. And he wasn't going to collaborate with the forces of, of law and order. Luckily for the police, Lenny Murphy was about to make his first mistake. In March 76, two women were driving along the Cliftonville Road when they were shot at from a passing vehicle. The gunmen abandoned their car and set it on fire on this street, right next to the Loyalist heartland of Mount Vernon. A witness saw a man acting suspiciously and called the police. They searched the street and found a gun. Next morning, with the street under surveillance, the man came back to look for the gun and was arrested. That man was Lenny Murphy. <laughs> 